She had dutifully created manuscripts for Rogers to read and share with those at the hearing. I worked so hard in typing that speech, she recalled later, and then he didn't read it. I was so disappointed. <laughs> Rogers did intend to read the text. But his extraordinary situational sense told him it would be better to be direct and personal with the brusque pastoral. So if we get that first clip. I'm very much concerned, as I know you are, about what's being delivered to our children in this country. And I've worked in the field of child development for six years now, trying to understand the inner needs of children. We deal with such things as, as the inner drama of childhood. We don't have to bop somebody over the head to make, him, to, to make drama on the screen. We deal with such things as getting a haircut or the feelings about brothers and sisters and the kind of anger that arises in simple family situations and we speak to it constructively. How long a program is it? It's a I'm half hour every day. Most channels schedule it in the, in the noontime as well as in the evening. Uh, WETA here has scheduled it in the late afternoon. Could we get a copy of this so that we can see it? Maybe not today, but I'd like to see the program. I'd like very much for you to see. I'd like to see the program itself, or any one of them, you see. We, we made a hundred programs for EEN, the Eastern Educational Network, and then when the money ran out, people in Boston and Pittsburgh and Chicago all came to the fore and said, we've got to have more of this neighborhood expression of care. And this is what, this is what I give. I give an expression of care every day to each child to help him realize that he is unique. I end the program by saying, you've made this day a special day by just your being you. There's no person in the whole world like you, and I like you just the way you are. And I feel that if we in public television can only make it clear that feelings are mentionable and manageable. We will have done a great service for mental health. So what's really interesting about the backstory is the question of how did it come to be that Fred Rogers was the person speaking for PBS? He'd only been on national television for a year. Uh, he was a kiddie TV show host. Well, how did he get that? And, and the answer is, uh, uh, there was a guy named Hartford Gunn, who was the president of WGBH in Boston. And he was the chairman of this group of uh, public television executives around the country that had been trying to plan uh, the start of PBS. And they had been meeting for several years. Uh, there was, as Fred mentioned in that tape, the Eastern Educational Network. So there were some cities that were linked. But they wanted a national network, and they thought each one of the stations, and there were a lot of educational stations even, even back then, community stations, lots of stations at universities, uh, but they weren't networked. And so the idea was that they needed uh, to be networked. And so Gunn, uh, when Gunn learned from his lobbyist in Washington that Pastore was, had agreed with Nixon that they could cut the $20 million out of the budget, he pulled his group together for, for a last meeting. Uh, they knew there was going to be a hearing in Washington. They had to go to Washington. And then Gunn uh, pulled equipment on his partners. All, all were executives who were running public television stations. And he said, I don't really need you to come. I have this guy named Fred Rogers that I want to come. Of course, they knew who Fred Rogers was. So they said, you can't be serious. A kiddie TV show host is going to represent us before a Senate subcommittee? Uh, but Gunn was a very, very savvy strategist. He had run some uh, for-profit businesses. He'd run a number of non-profits around Boston. Uh, I think he was a graduate of Harvard Business School, which uh, is no longer a credential that I admire, but back then probably. 
but he was a, he was a really smart strategist. And he knew Fred Rogers, because several times when, when Rogers was on the Eastern Educational Television Network, he had come to Boston to speak to uh, parents and children. And uh, every time, the staff of the station had grossly underestimated how big the, the crowds were going to be. They, they got prepared for, for 500 uh, the first time, and they got 10,000 parents and children stretching all the way down the street around Soldier's Field, Howard Place Football. Uh, and then Gunn had watched Rogers with the parents and with the children. And what he knew was, that when he got to Washington, he had to reach two different audiences at the same time. He had to reach the senators who were going to be there at the hearing listening to him in person. But he also, he knew it would be videotaped, he knew it would be on the news, he knew it would have a currency beyond the hearing. And he knew that this was the opportunity to begin to get a mass audience in the country to understand what the value was. And here's the other thing he knew. That, that Lots of you probably know too uh, from your studies and your and your teaching. He knew that what was compelling was not a bunch of numbers and a lot of business analytics about public television, but a story, a narrative. He knew that what would really move everybody would be an authentic, passionate narrative, and he knew he would get that from Fred Rogers. So several things happened coming out of that hearing. First of all, Pastore said at the end of the hearing, well, Rogers, it looks like you got the $20 million. He didn't even take a vote of his committee. He just announced that the, <laughs> the money was going to stay in the budget. But, but it was clear that Rogers had turned everybody in the committee in favor of holding on to that money, which means uh, about eight to 10 months later, PBS got started, which is, God knows how much good PBS has done. For, for our country. So that was a, a huge thing. Another thing that came out of it was that Rogers and Pastore became friends. And they had a long correspondence, uh, often about their children. Um, uh, about a year later, Pastore asked Rogers to come to Washington and share a task force on children and, and media. And they were, they were friends for some time. Another thing that came out of it was this clip has been shown for decades in business schools all across the country, in business schools, because it is seen as a great example of marketing. That, you know, effective marketing is not arguing people into a position, it's inspiring them to, to see uh, the story that you have, the narrative that you have. So and as far as I know, it's still being taught in some business schools as a great example of effective marketing. The final thing that came out of it, or at least by my lights, the final thing that came out of it was Fred Rogers then became sort of the, the spokesperson in America for higher quality television. Certainly for public television, but also for the idea that television could be culturally uplifting, television could be educational, television could be positive. And remember, uh, the students here won't remember because you. You, you've been watching television during the cable era when there's lots of good television. But in the 1970s and 1980s, television was all the all crap. It, wasn't, it was not good. It was seen primarily as, as a way of selling cereal or automobiles or something. Uh, but Rogers, for decades, in speeches, books that he wrote, articles that he wrote, uh, television programs that he created, uh, continued to be the spokesperson for the idea that television used properly could not only be educational, but could be uplifting. And sometimes he got really, really discouraged about that. His widow, Joanne, when I interviewed her, uh, told me that there were a couple of times he really seriously got depressed and thought and said to her, have I wasted my life? You know, he, he would see what's on television and he would feel badly about it. Um, he always came back around to feeling better about it. And then, of course, in the last few years of his life, he saw the emergence of cable television. And now, there's an extraordinary amount of still, this is bad television on cable, too. But there's an extraordinary amount of high quality programming on, 
on cable television. So I don't know, I don't think anybody can make the case that, that Rogers turned it around, but he was a relentless spokesperson for the idea that using media in uh, the most ambitious way to the highest possible standard uh, was something that we had to pay attention to. So I want to go on to my, my second story now. Uh, this one also is a very familiar one from Fred Rogers' uh, life and work. And this one has to do uh, with the little boy in the wheelchair that Rogers talks to and sings to. And, and some of you may have seen that clip. It's another famous, uh, well, it's actually one of those famous television clips uh, there is. And uh, the way this came about is that um, in 1979, Fred Rogers had been out of producing children's television for four years. He took a hiatus from, can you all hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. I'm going to adjust the mic. Mm -hmm. uh, he took a hiatus from producing children's television uh, in, in 1975, and he tried his hand at producing adult television, talk shows, specials on particular issues, and did a lot of it, and PBS was pretty supportive of him and gave him help to do it. It really wasn't that good, frankly. Uh, and he did, and the, the support was dwindling for him. And he was feeling uh, frustrated. Uh, he, his ideas, the ideas that he seemed to be having were more about children's television than, than grown-up television. So he decided to go back into producing children's television. Uh, and he made uh, a couple of decisions uh, with his mentor from the University of Pittsburgh, who I'll talk about a little bit more later, Dr. Margaret McFarland, who was one of the nation's great experts on early childhood education and child development. Uh, the two of them decided that what he would try to do when he went back to television is, is to produce theme weeks. So his idea was that he would take an entire week of five programs, the neighborhood where his, where his television house is and the neighborhood of Make Believe, and explore one theme for five straight days. And a lot of the people who advised him said, you know, the children can't pay attention to something for five days. They're not going to retain something from Monday to Tuesday or, or Wednesday. Uh, but he, he was convinced, and McFarland was convinced, uh, that that could work. The other decision that they made was they wanted to pull out all the stops and go after the toughest issues of life. Not just for children, for grown-ups to talk about the most difficult issues in life and to do it for little children, two and three and four years old. So they did theme weeks on violence. They did theme weeks on loss, which is a terrible fear children have, that they'll, that they'll get lost. They did theme weeks on death. His programming on death is extraordinary to this day, I think, uh, for grown-ups as well as children. And they did a, a theme week on divorce, which is one of the great threats uh, to a child. And in the theme week they were developing uh, on divorce, uh, Rogers wanted to take the approach, he wanted to explore the idea from a variety of different directions that although something can get broken, badly broken, like a divorce, there are ways to make it work. There are ways to sort of begin to put it back together. There are ways for the children to see that it can't exactly be fixed, but it can be made to work and, and come back together in a, in a constructive way. And then and one of his ideas was that he would get a child in a wheelchair who had a disability and show that that child, through the child's attitude and, and approach and thinking, and through the, the technology of the wheelchair, could kind of go on with life. He wanted to show that. So he told his staff that. And the, the staff said, oh, that's great. We, we've got lots of kids in wheelchairs in Pittsburgh. We'll get one for you. And Fred said, no, that's not what I want. I know the kid I want. Uh, his name is Jeff Erlinger from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He had a wall now. That would turn out to be kind of important. Uh, the kid's name actually is Jeff Erlinger. He's not from Milwaukee. 
He's from Madison. But Rogers had met Jeff and his family two years earlier when he made a talk in Milwaukee. And he said, I found out I need just the right kid to create just the right moment. And I know this kid can do it, so go find him. Well, they went out and tried to find Jeff Erlinger from Milwaukee, and of course they couldn't. And they came back and they said, we're sorry, Fred, we can't find him. We'll get somebody from Pittsburgh. He said, no, I, I want that kid. Go back and look again. And they did. They looked and looked and looked. They worked literally for weeks trying to, trying to find this kid. They finally came back and said, it's impossible. We've got to get a local kid. And Fred, who could be extraordinarily stubborn and petulant, but he was stubborn and petulant when he was fighting for a standard. You know, he famously set the highest standard for his program. There were times when he, with a full crew filming on, on the set, Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, would stop everything. Go over to the University of Pittsburgh to talk to Dr. McFarland because he thought there was a phrase that children would misinterpret. You know, he had a unionized crew on the clock sitting there. He was he had, he wanted always to set the highest standard, and he could be stubborn and willful in insisting on that. The staff loved him and they loved working with him, and they felt that he gave them a chance to do their best work. But they got very frustrated with him. So Fred said. Well, we're not going to do it. We're, we're going to cancel everything. <laughs> if you can't find the kid I want, we're going to cancel everything. Well, a couple of weeks later, Ed Sheriff, uh, who still worked for the Fred Rogers Company and back then handled correspondence for Fred Rogers, got a letter from a young girl named Perlanger from Madison, recognized immediately who it was, that, and it said in the letter that she was Jeff Perlanger's sister. And they got the family. And so they contacted the family. They were willing to, to come to Pittsburgh and, and do the film. Uh, everybody was agreed. And then right away, the family started asking the staff members they were talking to, where's the script? You know, Jeff needs to know what he's going to do. He needs to know, what's this television program going to be about? What's his role? What's he supposed to say? What's he supposed to do? We have to see his script. And so the staff began to get anxious about it. And they were pissed for a strip. And he said, no, don't worry about it. We're just going to talk. I'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. And he put them all off. And of course, what he knew, what Rogers knew, uh, was that if it was scripted, if it looked like a performance, it wouldn't have the authenticity. It wouldn't have the impact. It wouldn't be genuine. Only if it was completely spontaneous, and it is. Jeff Reiner wasn't prepared. I don't even know if Fred Rogers was prepared. He just went out to talk to this kid. But Rogers understood enough about creativity and television and media to know that the, the, the solid goal is authenticity. It's when it's real, when it doesn't seem as if it's, it's uh, been programmed. So he insisted that it be uh, simply by, by uh, the seat of the pants. Shall we play a, a little bit of it? Now, uh, can you tell my friends what it is that made you need this wheelchair? Sure. Well, when I was about seven months old, I had, um, I had a tumor, and it broke the nerves to tell my hands and legs what to do. I see. And they tried to cut the tumor, but they didn't, couldn't get it, and I became handicapped. And I got a wheelchair when I was four years old. That was your first one? Mm hmm When you were four? Uh-huh. Do you remember that? Yeah, sort of. You must have some mighty good doctors who've been taking care uh -huh. of you. Can you tell me any of your doctor's names? Yeah, I have a pediatrician, Dr. Hansen, who works in Madison St. Mary's Hospital. Mm -hmm. And then at UW, I have the bone doctor, Dr. Breed, who 
takes care of the bones, I guess, because he's guess a bone so. doctor. Uh -huh. Anyway, I had surgery earlier this summer because I have pain in my stomach called autonomic dysreflexia. And I Wh just. What was that? Autonomic word? dysreflexia. I'm not exactly sure what it means. But you sure can say it. Yeah. Anyway, so I had a surgery done just recently mm -hmm. to try and cut the sphincter because it's holding my urine in. Mm -hmm. So, well, you have a lot of things going on when you're... This just shows you have a lot of things happening to you when you're handicapped but most of the time. But, and uh, sometimes it happens when you're not handicapped. Of course. But you're able to talk about those things yeah. so well and help other people mm -hmm. who might have the same kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So I do want to read you a, a short passage of this because after all, I'm a writer, I'm not a fan. <laughs> you have to listen to some words. <laughs> At that point, Fred said to him, Jeff, I'm just going to ask you some questions and then we'll sing a song together. He did say, remember, we're talking to very young children, so don't use any words that are too big. Jeff Erlinger didn't quite heed Mr. Rogers' words. In one of the neighborhood's most memorable broadcasts in 1981, Mr. Rogers asked Jeff straightforwardly about the mechanics of his wheelchair and how he wound up in it. The young boy explains his medical condition, resulting from a spinal tumor, in sophisticated detail. Mr. Rogers listens intently and says simply, your parents must be very proud of you. This was the zen of Fred Rogers' radical acceptance. It was no topic he wouldn't address on air, no matter how difficult. We don't fudge things, he said once when asked about the source of the show's popularity. People long to be in touch with honesty. Producer Margie Whitmer recalls Jeff Erlinger's appearance on the neighborhood. It was one of the most stunning moments. Here's this child who has multiple disabilities, and Fred said, talk to me about that wheelchair. Talk to me about what's wrong with you. And this extraordinary kid talked about it in a matter-of-fact way. Fred presented the kids watching the show as, that's just the way he is. So, the things that, that these stories, the strengths of Fred Rogers that these stories illustrate to my mind uh, are his instinct uh, for authenticity, uh, his instinct for, for the genuine moment, and his setting of very, very high standards. Uh, and uh, I think those two things set his work apart in ways that particularly made them appealing to children and to the parents of the children who knew the thought that, that went into the show. Now, a few words about why I think he remains uh, a very important uh, cultural icon uh, in American society, even 16 years after he died. One has to do with education, and the other has to do with value. And uh, Rogers was, was, a, was a very lucky person. He had a lot of good luck in his life. And um, one of the uh, moments of good luck for him was when he came home from, on his spring break uh, from Rollins College, uh, saw television for the first time. His parents had the first television set in the Pro, Pennsylvania. <clears throat> and announced to his parents that he was going to New York to go into television. And his, his mother thought he was going to go to the seminary and become a Presbyterian minister, which he did later. His father was hoping he'd go into the family business. The family had a bunch of businesses in western Pennsylvania. Uh, but what, what Fred Rogers saw on television both appalled him at how bad it was and inspired him at the educational potential of television. So he, uh, the luck came in when it turned out his father uh, who was a very successful businessman with a lot of investments, had connections at RCA, which owned NBC, and helped Fred get an unpaid internship at NBC. 
And so Fred spent three years there learning television at NBC. And as it turns out, this is the lucky part, the 1950s at NBC is one of the great eras of American television. NBC was run by a guy named Pat Weaver back then, who's mostly famous today. He's still alive. Mostly famous today for being the father of Sigourney Weaver, the actress. Um, and there were one of the, the best known producers there was a man named Kirk Browning, who went on to win many, many awards on public television and commercial television. And so Rogers got to work with these people who were extraordinarily talented, extraordinarily talented and believed that television could be at the highest level as an art. They believed in television as an art, and that's how he learned television. So he came away from that experience equipped uh, to do good television, and he went to Pittsburgh to, to WQED, where he made a precursor to the neighborhood called The Children's Corner, which is a very fine program that won lots of awards. But he was horribly frustrated by it. Uh, it really, uh, it drove him crazy, because he felt it was just entertainment. It wasn't really educational television. And he was desperate to take the skills that he had learned and make really fine educational television. And uh, one way in which his frustration came out was he started going to a seminary to become a Presbyterian minister. He was still working at WQED. And one day, one of his teachers uh, at the seminary said, well, Fred, when you, uh, when you graduate, what sort of a ministry do you have in mind? yourself, meaning what church are you going to go to? Because that's all people who graduated from the seminary back then ever did. They went to a church. And Fred said, I want to have a ministry to children on television. And the teacher said, well, good luck with that. <laughs> uh, but he said that if you're interested in children, you need to go over to the University of Pittsburgh and you need to talk to Dr. Margaret McFarland, who runs the Child Development Program and see what they're doing and, see, and learn what they're doing. Well, he did, and, and, and Fred studied for several years under Dr. McFarland, and she remained his advisor and mentor for 30 years after that. But here's what was remarkably lucky about that. It turns out that the University of Pittsburgh, in the late 1950s, for a brief period of time, the University of Pittsburgh was one of the centers, important centers in the whole world, in terms of research into early childhood. Dr. McFarlane, Dr. McFarlane was a very important leader, but also at the University of Pittsburgh at that center back then was Dr. Barry Brazelton, who became famous doing television and, and books and articles about pediatrics and young children. Uh, also there was Dr. Benjamin Spock, who was teaching at Pitt then in the same center with Dr. McFarlane. And Eric Erickson, the great philosopher and thinker and student of human development, was it Pitt? So Fred Rogers, having got dropped in NBC, right at the time he could learn the art of quality television, got dropped into Pitt. And by eight years later, Pitt wasn't on, on, the, on the map the same way it was in the 1950s. So Rogers got the tools at Pitt to know what was really important in child development, to know how to inform his media with the best thinking about child development. So he got a great gift from those academics, but he gave a great gift back to the academics. He reached a mass audience with the message about early childhood education. I really believe that Fred Rogers, more than anybody else, taught America about early childhood education and its tremendous importance. Think about it. Back in the 1950s, if you said early childhood education to somebody, they thought you meant kindergarten. There wasn't any such thing as early childhood education. Today, go to almost any town or city of any size in America and their early childhood education centers. It, the, the public gets it. The whole nation gets it. That these first few years are critically important. Uh, and Fred, over the decades, uh, from that time that he was studying, studying with the Parliament in the 50s, did as much to teach the country about the importance of that as anybody. Sesame Street, of course, also taught the country a great deal about education. 
but Sesame tended to be a little bit older, and Rogers tended to be a little bit uh, younger. So I think in the field of education, uh, Rogers seems like, like a giant to me for, for what he accomplished. And of course, in, in, the, in the field of media, I think he's a giant. He, he was an entrepreneur at the very, the very beginning, before people even discussed what entrepreneurship was in terms of the approach he took to his program. The other reason I think he's important is values. And interestingly, for Fred, the most important thing in his life was not Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. And it wasn't children, and it wasn't education, and it wasn't television. It was the values that he lived his life by. And of course, for him, those were Christian values. He was raised in the Latrobe Presbyterian Church, sitting uh, with his mother. From, from, from his early age, his mother took him out of Sunday school, put him in the pew beside her, and he would pepper her with questions all through the minister's sermon. And she never shushed him. She treated him like a serious person and listened to him and answered his questions. But what Fred also understood is that those values that he got from the Presbyterian Church are universal human values. And Fred became a great student of all philosophies and religions. On his, one of the many times I went to interview Joanne Rogers, she took me in to show his bedroom and, and his bedside table and stacked up on his bedside table where she had touched nothing since, since since he died. Uh, there were books on Buddhism, Jainism, Judaism, uh, Lao Tzu, Catholic mysticism. There was also uh, a Bible, the Presbyterian Bible, but there were all these books on other philosophies and religions. And what Fred Rogers understood was these universal human values that he got as Christian values were the most important thing in life. And his dedication to trying to live his life by those values was the most important thing to him in his life. He woke up every morning at 5 a.m. to read the Bible and pray. But guess what he prayed for? It's so revealing. He didn't pray for success for Mr. Rogers' neighborhood or himself. He didn't pray for his family to get something wonderful or something good to happen to him. He prayed that everybody he was going to encounter that day, and he would review in his mind who he was going to see at work and who he was going to see away from work, that he could be as good and kind and thoughtful a person as he possibly could be. Those are important values. I think he's an icon for those values, and I think that's why today, uh, years after he's died, years after, his program went off the air basically in 2000, you can still get it. Uh, from, from PBS, from Amazon, but, it, but it, it, it stopped national syndication, maybe it was a couple years after 2000 when it stopped national syndication, but he still remains this important uh, figure, and I think it's because we live in a time when we're all worried about these values. We're worried about what's going to happen to these values, and we count on them. Is the world going to keep operating in a way that honors those values? And Rogers is a touchstone for all of us. Thank you.